Hi, everybody. Hello. Uh, <laughs> it's Pam, Sarah, Grable, and Sarah Reed joining you from Sacramento, California for a little bonus surprise episode of Working Broadcast. <laughs> Hi. <Hey. laughs> um, I am on a road trip right now, and so I'm in Sacramento, and so I'm so excited to be hanging out with the Sarahs <laughs> uh, to chat about what you're up to and the designs you're working on. And if you have any questions for them, uh, let me know and we can ask them here. Um, yeah, so for those who might not know, uh, can you let people know who you are? So your role in the industry and we'll start from there. Sure. All right. uh, so I'm Sarah Graybill. I'm a designer. I co-design games with my husband, John Schulters. Uh, I'm, I've also done development work for publishers in the industry. Uh, and I currently work as a project manager for Panda Game Manufacturing. So it's really fun because I get to see all sides of the industry, both from the publisher side. I've had that experience um, from the design side and then also now from the manufacturing side. The only thing I haven't really had any experience with is distribution. But otherwise, it's really fun to get to see all these different parts. And with uh, working on the manufacturer side, especially, I get to work with small creators, small publishers, right. uh, and help them make their dreams come true. So it's really fun to be able to take someone's projects that's just a list of components, but have this vision for the game and be able to see it and help them make it happen. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm Sarah Reed. Um, I design with my husband, Will, and um, uh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, we have a couple of games published, yep. uh, Project Dreamscape and Oaxaca. We've done a couple other small projects here and there. We did a postcard game for Button Shy. We've developed a, um, what do you call it, like a one shot for Adventure Tactics that will be coming out, I think, this year. And we've got other stuff that's uh, in the works. So we're mainly designers and I help run the local game design group here in Sacramento. So if anybody is in the Sacramento area or is ever visiting, uh, it's the Gamers Grind uh, playtesting group. And we meet up at Game Getaway. The game Getaway. <laughs> in Sorry. Folsom, California. He's, 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 he's moved, changed his name. He's changed oh, okay. the place's name. It used to be yeah. called the Gamers Grind. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's first iteration. Oh, okay. um, so that's why it was called the Gamers Grind Playtesting Group. Oh, okay. uh, but now his actual store is called the Game Getaway the game. up in Folsom. Yeah. Um, so Which yeah. is how I met Sarah. So right. I really view Sarah <laughs> as a central part of my backstory and yeah. my <laughs> industry experience is a real ambassador for mm -hmm. um, gaming and game design, game development, and she's a real advocate for uh, creators, I think. Yeah. So I think that's really great. Because <laughs> yeah. Sarah, you started this group, the design group. Well, I will take a step back in that I didn't completely start it. Mm -hmm. So we were going to Ron, he's the owner of the store, when in his first location. And we were talking to him and we were enjoying playing games. And we got to starting to design games. And so right. we would talk to him about it. Well, apparently other people were talking to him about it mm -hmm. too. So he said to us one day, you know, there's other people who design games. Why mm -hmm. don't you meet here? So he technically started the first meeting right. by saying, hey, everybody come. Right. From that point, because I love to organize, <laughs> that's just kind of my nature. I took over and just ran with it. Yeah. And we have a Facebook group and I try to make sure to post up on meetup.com. And so from that point forward, I, I run the group in, in that mm -hmm. respect. Mm -hmm. so. And how often do you meet? We meet once a month and right now, and thankfully it's been this way for a while, it's the second Saturday mm -hmm. of every month. Right now it's 1 p.m. to about 6, depending mm -hmm. on how it goes, um, but a good, you know, good chunk of the afternoon. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So if anyone's in the area, definitely check that out. Yeah. Because a lot of, a lot of good things that have come up from this group as well, because you, that's where you met your business partner, right? For um, Oaxaca and yeah. Project Dreamscape. Yep. Ben uh, Haskett. Um, he came to the design group. I think he kind of found out the same way of he happened to find the, the game store and found out that there was a design meeting and he came and I really think it was probably his second or third meeting. We showed him Project Dreamscape. He literally stood up during the play test and said, I have to publish this. This, yeah. this has to be published. And he had some experience before. He had his game published before and then he did a solo publishing of Tower. Mm -hmm. And so he felt that he had the business acumen to um, move it forward. Mm -hmm. And so he helped us get Project Dreamscape published. And then we continue to work with uh, him on Oaxaca. 
Right. Yeah. That's really great. And Sarah, you were saying that this group was kind of your introduction really to the industry yep. and helped you make connections. Can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, through that um, connection, through the Gamers Grind Playtest group, I met Sarah and Ben, obviously. Uh, also, another publisher for Pull the Pin Games, formerly Overworld Games. Mm -hmm. Over Overworld, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Brian, Brian Hank, Hank yeah. used to come to those meetings, so I oh, met yeah, yeah, him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and not only the really invaluable feedback of mm -hmm. you know play testing specific games or bouncing ideas off of each other, yeah. uh, but also just getting comfortable pitching your game, right. getting comfortable talking to people in the industry mm -hmm. um, with Brian's experience, getting comfortable knowing the kinds of decisions that publishers make. I mean, a first time game designer tends to throw everything in but the kitchen sink or maybe including the kitchen sink. <laughs> yeah. And then you learn by talking with publishers about, hey, these things cost money to make and there mm -hmm. are manufacturing decisions at play. Mm -hmm. And so it was really those conversations that um, helped kind of pave that way. And then yeah. all in addition, going to local conventions. So going mm -hmm. to um, Dendrocon in the Bay Area or going to KubaCon or some of these other, even the smaller conventions in the Sacramento area, right. um, going to ConQuest, going to things like that, that um, it wasn't, I mean, going to conventions is, has been a real uh, avenue for our success. It's certainly not the only way, but um, for us, it's how I got to meet people in the industry and, and right. talk to people. Yeah. And it's really interesting because you work with a manufacturing company now and you have a really real breadth of knowledge in the industry. Is that affecting or influencing your game design choices? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of like knowing how the sausage get, gets yeah, made, but absolutely. less gross, right? It's yeah. more fun. <laughs> um, it doesn't make me shy away from a sausage. It makes me just really be like, oh, a sheet of poker cards is right. uh, 54 cards. Mm -hmm. I need to design cards in sets of 54 for maximum mm -hmm. efficiency or right. just really thinking even in uh, you know, a current design that I have signed with a publisher of knowing hey, we've been play testing it and pitching it with glass marbles that are 25 millimeters. Those are going to be really heavy and expensive and kind of tailoring my expectations for uh, components. Or then on the flip side, also really recognizing and celebrating when I see amazing components and really unique things right. uh, coming into play. And it also has changed the way I give feedback to people too, to newer designers mm -hmm. um, of saying, hey, this game with you know all these holes drilled into the board is really cool, but that's <laughs> going to be a challenge to manufacture. Have you thought about these other solutions right. um, that don't take away from the game experience right. or maybe change the game experience, but in a unique way? Mm -hmm. Um, so absolutely having that perspective um, and having the publisher perspective, having done development work with a publisher, mm -hmm. knowing all the hours that go into something. Right. Um, it gives me a, a lot of perspective on other games that are published. Absolutely. Sort of behind the scenes look at how things are made. It's important. Yeah. Because sometimes I'll design games and I'll just be like, I'm just going to do whatever and let the publisher figure that part out. Yeah. But it definitely is good to have that in the back of your mind of like, <laughs> Right. Is this possible? <laughs> right. Yeah. Some publishers won't even look at anything yeah. or they'll look at it and say, uh, this game will never get made because it's of its components. Right. Even if you say, well, I'm open to changing them. They kind of want, it totally depends on the publisher, of course, mm -hmm. but they want you to have, they might expect you to have the knowledge of knowing, I understand and recognize that this is the pipe dream version of the game and let's right. figure out some ways to, to tailor it down. Be, be adaptable, be, be adaptable. flexible yeah. for sure. Yeah. And so Sarah, when you <clears throat> design games, are there other things that you're also thinking about that kind of have a framework for you when you well, design? Well, for me, a lot of what I wouldn't, um, I don't want to use the word limit. It's more of a, I have a very good frame of uh, visual accessibility right. mm -hmm. because my husband, Will, is legally blind. Mm -hmm. um, that does include color blindness, but he's kind of on the severe visual dis disabled uh, challenge wise. Right. So there's a lot of times where we, when we design games, we aren't so focused on the components because we want to be able to make it so that he can play it. So to back up. Most of the time when he plays a game, he never looks at the board. Right. He literally does not see the things in front of him. Mm -hmm. So one is we design for open information and uh, two for also, I guess, on a little bit more of simplistic components. Right. So stuff that is easily manipulated and moved um, and so doesn't take fine motor skills. It's not a complicated map. 
So there's a lot of things that we don't design mm -hmm. because of that. And it's not, I, that's why I don't want to use it as a limitation because it's right. not. No. It's more of, there are ways that that enhances gameplay because mm -hmm. it can be more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, if something is very visually intense, that can throw people off. Right. So we tend to build more with cards, simple components. Uh, we do a lot of resources with that are shaped because again, if you have a distinct shape, mm -hmm. then he can feel them and say, okay, these are different. Right. Um, like if we ever were to do coins, we would need to make sure they are different sizes of coins. Mm -hmm. Right. I know it's really easy when you're doing a punch board sheet, if you just have them all the same size and just different colors. Mm -hmm. Right. But that doesn't help someone who might have a visual disability. Right. Um, so I think that shapes a lot of it. And then there's just certain game mechanisms that we really like. Mm -hmm. When we um, first got into board, or board gaming or just gaming in general, I actually introduced him to modern board gaming through Magic the Gathering. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is really intense. And so if you already now know that he's visually disabled, mm -hmm. when we would get a new set of magic he would literally have to memorize everything mm -hmm. right. his vision at the time was still good enough that he could use a magnifier to read the title of the card that is all he could read of every single card mm -hmm. and since that is a closed information game he would have to memorize from the name wow. what everything on that card was wow and so when he would play other people thankfully obviously you have to play your card so he would ask them right what did you just play can you read everything? So, I mean, we typically didn't do anything competitive, but we tried a couple times. Yeah. Um, but that style of gaming has really stuck with us and we translated into deck builders like Dominion. So we love engine building, combo driven. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where uh, both of our games so far really are is uh, card chaining and manipulation, uh, both Project Dreamscape and Oaxaca are really rooted in that especially project dreamscape he built that off of kind of the magic the gathering uh types the, right. the black the red the green you would find similar player styles in project dreamscape so like there's cards in there that even though i'm the designer i can't use because it's not my play style right but then i talk to other people and they absolutely love that particular card but the great thing is you can you have choices mm -hmm. and those type of things so choices are key yes mm -hmm. <laughs> yes we are really big on giving meaningful choices yeah. right it doesn't have to be a complex choice mm -hmm. right but it has to be a meaningful choice and what could you maybe expand on that a bit let's expand on that a bit okay. more of like what does that mean for it to be meaningful okay so meaningful so one of the things we like is uh, cards that have multiple purposes. Mm -hmm. So you have a card that does, let's just say two things. You either can use it for money or you could use it for an action. Right. That's a meaningful choice because you can't do it for both and you have to do it for one or the other. Right. Sometimes in games you have choices that don't feel so meaningful. And I just, I'm trying to think of something. Um, either going left or right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like if you don't have enough information yeah. on right. why, right. why is this choice? Yeah. Right. What's the impact? What's the impact? Yeah. Do I, again, do I need to go left? Do I need to go right? Yeah. If I don't know what's at the end of those paths, then yeah. it's not a meaningful choice. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of games we've seen where they just don't give you choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the classic roll and move. You roll, you move somewhere, you see what happens to you. Right. Yes. You, you're dealing with consequences instead right. of It's happening decisions. to you. Right. You don't have agency. Yeah. Yes. We really like the agency of you want to play the game. You don't want the game to play you. Right. Yeah. You know, otherwise, let's watch a movie. And yes, exactly. It's happening to me. <laughs> well, you I know. played Snakes and Ladders the other day. Oh, no. mm. <laughs> My sister and her husband wanted to play it. And I'm like, okay. I'm just going up, going down, going up, going mm -hmm. down. And right. It's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. It's it funny. Was, it, when, was, it was hard. <laughs> yeah. I had a board game group at the office I used to work in um, when I worked for a different company. And we would play um, like skip bow or card games mm. or things like that. And yeah. one time this gal brought in Candyland, which has famously has, there's no, <laughs> dis it's just the game is determined already by the deck. You know, <laughs> yeah. you flip it over and you move those spaces. Yeah. The next player flips it over and move those spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Like predetermined. I don't need to be there, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and I really struggled with that for a long time. And then I yeah. was speaking with other designers saying like, that's not a game. And, mm. and finally somebody corrected me gently, you know, and said, yeah, it's not a game for adults for one, clearly. Yeah. 
Uh, two, it may not have choices, but it does teach game principles. You know, it's teaching very young kids, like how to take turns, how to match colors. Right. Most importantly, that's why it game, exists. So, yeah. yeah. But how to lose gracefully, how to play, you know, <laughs> This is whatever. a very generous person you yeah. were talking to. <laughs> <laughs> I am a uh, <laughs> but, it, it, but that, I mean... First of all, being able to recognize that that game has no agency and no choices. That's yeah. a pretty sophisticated realization. That's not, true. Not sophisticated compared to other board gamers. But yeah. I don't think your average person who may be just getting into board games really thinks about, mm -hmm. oh, I get to make these choices. This yes. game isn't just determined by luck or determined by uh, the game itself or whatever. Right. That... Which I think is why I have difficulty with the Amerithrash side of games. Right. Because a lot of it is do some neat things, roll the dice, and just see what happens to you. Yeah. Right. I have trouble with those games because I do come at it from a more strategic perspective of I want to be able to affect the things that are happening. I need at least dice mitigation mm -hmm. yeah. like a chance that it's gonna go my way yes right and that that's just my style but obviously there's a lot of games out there because there's a lot of right. different gamers right. and so other people love chucking those dice and just seeing what happens right right so that's true. <laughs> yeah. it is a balance because you do want a little bit of luck right. but you don't want all right. like it's yeah. just kind of like changing those dials mm -hmm. up and right. down yeah. finding the right balance right so, you want mystery. I think that's yes. what people are craving is like unknown. You don't and want it to be predictable. To, yes. Right. The suspense. Or for things to be like, oh, it all comes down to this. And when that yes. die rolls over to a six, you're like, yes, yeah. you know, but Absolutely. that's fun. Um, yeah. As long as it doesn't come with, if it rolls a one, then your whole yeah. day is ruined. Yeah, know? exactly. So. Yeah. <laughs> and it's true that you do learn a lot from, from, you know, bad games right you you learn from games that you might not enjoy playing you learn mm -hmm. from from good like games that you do enjoy playing if you play the whole gamut right i think you do as a designer that's good for you to do yeah, oh, yeah. i've yeah i personally i know there are some people that are purists that don't want to play other games because mm -hmm. they don't want to accidentally take ideas or don't want things to filter in or right, whatever right. but for me that's essential because yeah. i that's the only way I'm going to say, oh, that really didn't feel great. Right. And then dissect why that didn't feel great Absolutely. and learn how to avoid that. Yeah. Um, or even visually, you know, mm -hmm. be like, man, the, you know, the UI on this card is really challenging. And then thinking about like, I, you know, I hold the cards in a certain way. So I really want that icon in the top left mm -hmm. instead of in the bottom right where my hand is, you yes. know, while I'm holding the card. And Absolutely. that's just something that you don't think about until you play a bunch of games or right you know, and, and i'm games. a similar proponent of play more games like uh something i can't talk about fully is we are working on a secret project mm. we were um how do i put this we are delving into areas that we're not mm. used to we like to make a lot of small games mm -hmm. and that's where where we have kind of felt like we should start small games tight games and you know for a lot of reasons we're now pushing the envelope for ourselves mm. to, on the secret project so will and i were like we need to play more games. We right. need to, we need to play games in this style because it's not we it's not in our wheelhouse. It's not what we typically play. So we've been trying to find more games like that mm -hmm. and we've found some good ones and we've found some bad ones yeah. and we've been able to learn from both of them not to steal ideas right. but to understand how does the games flow mm -hmm. right what feels good in yeah. what you do and how it all looks spatially on the table and right. those kind of things because we had thought well what if we make an actual board but then there's more games now that are using tiles so we're exploring that concept mm -hmm. of well module yeah, yeah making it more yeah. modular so it's different when you play it every single time rather than the more classic here's a big giant board that fits on the table sort of right yes. <laughs> yeah <laughs> very cool um so you mentioned some projects you're working mm -hmm. on so maybe let's talk about some of the ones you can talk about <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think you brought some prototypes of current things you're working on. So maybe Sarah, maybe we can start with you. You can tell us sure. about some of you're working on. Uh, so uh, my husband and I are working on a game that's currently being called Crack the Code. Um, it's essentially a cooperative puzzle solving game. So it has some hidden information. Yeah. Um, each player will have a set of marbles in front of them of random colors. 
um, the actual marbles may not be this big and will also be double encoded to help with colorblind. Um, but they'll have a set of marbles in front of them that they can't see, so they can see everybody else's setup, but not their own. Oh, okay. And uh, I don't know how well you can see it here, but they'll have a unique code. Um, everybody else will have a code that also has these four marbles, but in a different orientation. And the way you win the game, everyone wins the game at the same time, is if everyone has their code correct. Right. So you're using actions, a limited set of actions, um, and it's essentially, can you solve the puzzle with enough actions to, between passing marbles or taking marbles or other things? And Is it sort of like mastermind? Like yeah, in it's sense... a little bit like, oh, okay. like cooperative mastermind right. with kind of that hidden element, similar right. to what Hanabi does, but right. you're, you're not giving clues to other players exactly, but you're kind of manipulating marbles. It's like hand manipulation oh, okay. and mastermind and, and things like that. Yeah, and it's really cool that act, sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> I played it a couple of times. Yeah. So it's really cool. But yeah, the actions will actually let you swap marbles, but it's not just, oh, you need to put it over there in the middle because you can, well, at least last time I played Yep. It. Okay. You could only put it in from the side. From the sides. Yeah. The trays ah. that these go in will kind of be arc shaped, like inverse U shaped almost. Okay. So yeah. you can pull a marble from anywhere, but you can only put it in the okay. end of the U so that things kind of slide together. Okay. And right. So there's a little bit of the, what happens when I take this yellow marble out? Where does that mean the oh, green marble rolls? Very and, cool. And right. things like that. And that's really interesting because if you're playing with four people, there's three people who can see what you've got, but they can't tell you what you've got. And right? they can't communicate. They all know what they see, but maybe one person has a plan for how it's going to be done. And another right. person has a plan okay. for how it's going to be done. And they can't talk about it with right. each other. Right. Okay. Um, so it's, it's very engaging and it's mm -hmm. a very different, I mean, cause I love co-op games and, and of course, generally speaking, we don't play hidden right. stuff. But this was a very interesting take on it of you have to work together and you're trying to manipulate the marbles that you can see, but then hoping that you aren't taking something from somebody else that you oh, need. Right, right. So it, it can get really complicated <laughs> when you go for this yellow and someone's like, ah. <laughs> right. And are they that. are they allowed to? Uh, I mean, well, it's probably <laughs> group dependent, right? Probably, you know. <laughs> I think the general rules. And one thing that's really great that the publisher is working with us on, and we're so glad they're taking it in this direction, is we built it kind of as a mini campaign that you start really easy. You start maybe not with this, but everybody has their own unique set. Like I'm trying to collect all the red marbles. Okay. And so it doesn't have to be in a specific order because I'm just trying to collect all the red. Yeah. Sarah's trying to collect all the blue. Yeah. You know, you might be trying to collect all the green and we all know that going in. Okay. So, and, and lots of open information. You can see all the marbles on the mm. table and be like, okay, I can see three greens, so I know I must have one green already, you right. know, and so you start out there and then progressively get harder. So mm -hmm. kind of unlock these things that make oh, the game harder and have cool. new modes of play, yeah. new actions available, Ooh. new wrenches in the works that make it harder. Because yeah, um, I remember with some, you took some of the actions out, which some, definitely made it harder. Yeah. Because there's some really nice basic, like, switching and stuff right. like that. Right, like, you're right. Like, it's like you rely on that <laughs> right. to be able to do things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden there's much more complicated things to right. try to do. Yeah. And right. can you do multiple actions? You can kind of combo them? Yeah, right? you can combo them. So the way, which maybe is different from how you yeah. played, it, it used to be that you there was just a deck and on your turn you'd have a choice of two actions. Yeah. Um, now we've kind of uh, broken up the turn structure. So there are no more turns exactly. It's more just rounds. In a round, you'll put out the number of actions, uh, players plus one. So there's always, everybody always has a choice of mm. more than one. And then whenever you feel compelled to do one of those actions, you do it. So oh, if you've done an cool. action that round, then you're out for the round. People can okay. still manipulate your tray, but you can't take an action anymore. Okay. But if you know, like, I really want to send something from myself to somebody else, um, send a marble for myself to somebody else, you can do it. Or if you and another player are kind of in sync and you're like, well, I want to do this thing, but I need them to do something first. Mm. You can kind of, without commu directly communicating, right. like, sync up and, um, oh. and, and then you're dealing with the restriction of the actions that are available at that time, you mm -hmm. know? So, right. um, so we can show the, yeah, sure. So, so it's like receive, receive, which send. is taking a marble from somebody else. Yeah. Um, route, which is routing a marble from one person to another person. So you're not taking or receiving anything in your tray okay. or sending anything. You're yeah. just moving it from person A to person B. Mm -hmm. um, sending, which is 
kind of one of the more mm. complicated ones because not complicated, uh, more risky ones. You're sending right. a marble from yourself to somebody else without seeing it. Mm -hmm. um, of course, once you pass it through the table, then you get to see it. But if you're like, okay, well, I have three reds and one yellow. So chances are good. I'm going to send the red one. Mm -hmm. But if you pull it out and you're like, ah, oh, it's the yellow uh, one, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, so. if someone gives you a marble, you, right. see, it you coming, see it coming to and you. And you know which side it's on. Right. So you do start to form an idea of what's in front of you. Oh, right. So if, for whatever reason, someone gives you a red, right. but you know you don't need it there or someone else needs it more, mm -hmm. right. then you, you can, can move yeah. it. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's kind awesome. of this process of discovery. And yeah. uh, it's something that, I mean, it's definitely on the lighter side. It's mm -hmm. more of like a party puzzle-y yeah. thing, but it's something we're really well, I excited love that. about. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't wait to play it. It's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Sarah, read what did you Yeah, do? so... Most of our focus has been on the secret project, which of course is no fun since I can't tell you about it. <laughs> but um, I recently, I guess I'll talk about the newest one. So this hasn't even been play tested. Um, long story short, I'll try anyways. Um, I've been playing this little app game that I just, I found really interesting. I like the mechanisms mm -hmm. and it was just a little uh, kind of a dice battling game. And so I was starting to look at some of the mechanisms and I'm like, this is really cool. I'd love to do something like it in a physical board game, but I'm like, but I don't want it to just be another battling game. Hmm. So I first stopped before actually taking any mechanisms. And I said, what do I want to make games about? And one of my focuses lately has been more positivity in games hmm. and exploring themes that are important, but maybe a little challenging. So I thought about mental health. Mm -hmm. What if what you're fighting is your mental health symptoms that you've got mm -hmm. these obstacles that you face all the time? Yeah. And I wanted to do symptoms because everybody has different diagnoses, but we often share symptoms. Mm -hmm. So it, it um, let me, cause it's been a little while since I've looked at, um, so hold on. So like, um, I tried to pick, I mean, obviously still in the works, but like apathy, insomnia, body pain. These are things that we can share even if our diagnosis is completely different. Right. And so once I figured out what theme I wanted to do, then I could borrow the mechanisms that I kind of liked and then I expanded it. So it's actually a um, cooperative, um, what do you call it? Not flip and write, but it's roll and write without the dice. Mm, it's okay. got the cards. Flip and fill. Right. Flip or and a... fill or whatever. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Draw and draw. Yeah, draw and draw. I think it's more draw and draw. So you get these symptom cards. And so you've got a player sheet that's not very interesting right now because I made it in a word. <laughs> um, but at the top, there's a slot for three symptoms mm. that you get. So everybody's going to get one of these sheets. And so you slot the symptoms in at the top of the cart. So my symptoms for the day are body pain, insomnia, and apathy. So the whole thing with good day, bad day is at the end, you are attempting to make your day good. Mm. But if you fail and, you, and I'm still working through on how the cooperative aspect works, right. but there's uh, areas where you can help each other because friends mm. often can give you that boost to get through the day that somehow you can't make that step forward, but they can help you mm -hmm. make that step forward. So um, I've got lots of dice. I don't know yet how much dice it's going to take. So right. this is where I just bought cubes of dice. Nice. So one of the colors is for the symptom dice. So you're going to get a certain number of symptom dice and you roll them. The first symptom gets a, um, activated with a one or a two. And then the next one is a three or a four and a five or a six. So you roll like, I think I started with five. You roll five dice, whatever they roll, you place them on. Mm. And then that's how bad that symptom is mm. that day. Right. Interesting. And so then your rest of your sheet are your tools mm. and you get your own color of dice and you get so many. And then those um, dice then activate different tools. Oh. So you've got like, you can adjust your commitments for the day, or you can go to counseling or there's some sort of creative endeavor that can help you. Cause like, I know for me, when I suffer body pain, thinking on something creative can mm -hmm. literally get my mind right. off the pain. Right. So you've got these tools that uh, you assign your dice to the tool, which will then affect right. the symptoms. Mm. And the goal is to resolve, address 
each of the symptom dice. Right. And if you don't, then their bad effect happens. Mm. Um, if they're unmanaged, like this one is immediately lose one spoon. So I did the whole spoon oh, theory that's and I'm going to incorporate that into, yeah. so for those who don't know, spoon theory is just, it's, it's energy. There's a whole thing on it. I suggest looking it up. It's a great story. <laughs> um, but basically one spoon is energy. Yeah. So you've got um, a track of spoons. And so if you run out of spoons, you've lost, right. you have a bad day. Yeah. But it, there's a symptom management track. And so if you can get to the end of the track and you've managed all your symptoms, you have a good day. Mm -hmm. And then there's a friendship track because that's where you can literally take one of your dice give it to another player, oh. you both get a boost because hmm. it always feels good to help somebody else. Right. And then of course they feel better because they got help. Right. So that's kind of where it started. I have this made. It has not even been play tested yet. <laughs> so it's been one of those things that I've been wanting to do for like, I've had it done since like the end of November, but you know how yeah. December goes. Yeah. Yeah. December is never a productive month. <laughs> never. Is this so this is on the list of playtest next meetup? Yeah. Well, I'm actually hoping now that we're moving pretty quickly on the um, secret project. I've got a few things to revise this week. Um, hopefully going to turn our attention to this hopefully next week because Will and I literally just need to sit down. I have two sheets. Yeah. And just Will and I will test it. Right. Because our philosophy is we don't personally like to take stuff to the group until we've at least tested it once. Right. I, I personally, it's just me. I don't like to waste people's time yeah. or anything like that. And, it, and I know everyone says, Oh, don't worry about it. Bring it anyways. I'm like, eh. <laughs> not me. Just how yeah. I do things. I think that's a good, that's a good rule of thumb. Yeah. So just, just do a quick play test yourself. Right. You can usually find glaring things right. pretty quickly. <laughs> right. It's, it's the, I don't want someone else to suffer through the worst of it. Right. Yeah. Maybe the second worst. Of it. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> no problem doing that. Yeah. <laughs> So that's, that's, uh, I do have another one, but I, I, this is the one I really am very excited and yeah. anxious, uh, to get out. I have, I know a couple of people on Twitter that are looking forward to it. And I semi promised that I would work towards a print and play towards the end of January, if this goes well, hmm. cause the nice thing is it is just this sheet. Yeah. And I think just this number of cards, I want to say two, sh two sheets, three sheets of cards. Mm -hmm. It always looks more when it's sleeved. Yeah. Um, so I figure as a print and play, that's a pretty low requirement. Right. Other and than dice, yeah. you need to get a lot of dice. Right. Yeah. Which most people have. Most dice. people have most dice. People have yeah. dice. So that would be it for print and play. So I'm hoping if we get this going and it's in a good spot to share. Right. Cause again, I don't want someone to go through the worst of it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, hopefully towards the end of January, see what other people think about it. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. Um, I'm just going, cause I can't see the comments. I'm oh. just going to see if any viewers have questions for you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> just one second. Let's see what, what's going on in the chat. Mm -hmm. Hey Kathleen. Hey Barbara. <laughs> Hi <Okay>. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think we're good. And Kathleen says Candyland is thematically perfect. Yes, it is. Okay, yes. <laughs> yes, delicious. If I uh, if I played Candyland the way in my dreams, where when I land on a space, I get to eat a piece of candy, then instantly my yes. uh, interest in the game goes up. So <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> um, you should just do that now. If you yeah. Have to, if you just <laughs> add candy to the board. Um, I just have a, a quick question. Um, regarding manufacturing because you're here. Sure. So the game that I'm mainly focused on right now is about wind changing direction Ooh. and it affecting the direction that the cards move. Okay. Sort of similar, kind of in the sense of, you know, labyrinth where you move the, yeah. the tiles. So a play tester, I think it was my sister Liz, uh, had the suggestion of what if I had a board? Because currently it's just cards and a grid. Mm -hmm. What if I had a board? And then when the wind changes, because currently you have to like change the direction of the wind and okay. then that just changes the way that cards move. If you actually had like a dial hmm. and it changed the direction of the wind and that would change the the direction of the dividers, then, oh. then you would move the cards, you would slide them. Yeah. So there's how many sets of cards or rows of five cards? Five by five. Five by five. So there would be five or four dividers essentially between yeah. one between each column or row. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Wow. I mean, that sounds really complex and I would love to 
figure out how to make that happen. Okay. But, um, not standard. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, it have to be something created, um, uniquely. So yes. my approach generally is to like, try to find the really cool, like dream way to make it mm. and then try to find the way to make it that is really novel but cheap, you know, like yeah. the cardboard the, way to do it. And yeah. the, the plastic cards way to on do the it. table work fine. Right. That was just sort of like, yeah. should I even bother trying to engineer this thing? Right. So I guess my question, and maybe it's hard to uh, visualize it without actually seeing it, is would these gates essentially yeah. change while cards are on the table. So they need to have clearance so they don't mess up the cards when they shift yeah. direction, right? Mm -hmm. There's okay. always, well, there's almost always five by five grid yeah. of cards. Right. Sorry, five by five, yeah, cards. So 25 cards Yep. change the direction of the wind, but people could change them midway through their turn. So there might be some cards removed. Mm. And it's something mm. that couldn't really be achieved by just rotating the board. Like it actually needs to be the direction, like it couldn't be essentially a lazy Susan type device built in it that changes things um, or could that work? Would um, something like that work? Cause you're not changing where I, cards, are, cards are positioned. No. Yeah. It's just, it's, I guess the idea is just making the sliding of them easier. The sliding of them easy. I yeah. see. So, so you they need, like, stay in channels. The same. Yeah. That, okay. Yeah. And then you would need the chain, the shape or the direction of those channels to change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> that sounds like a really fun challenge <laughs> yeah. and I would love to see the game in more detail so that yeah. I could noodle on it for a little bit. Cause that sounds really fun. Do you think, you know, from a designer's perspective, should I just, when I start pitching this, yeah. should I sh present it as the cards on the table and then be like, and if you wanted to do it this way, yeah, personally, you could I would. Yeah. Well, I'm a, it's not that I'm a minimalist, but again, from our background and way, the way we've been focusing on games is I do start with what I think the prototype needs to be, but then I always look for ways to slim it down. Right. Mm. And I think just because of how, I know Sarah and I were talking about this earlier, how inundated the market is right now, mm. I feel it's much easier to get to an audience with a smaller, tighter game. Yeah. Uh, length of game, size of game, all that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's, again, just my perspective. Mm -hmm. So for pitching a game, I personally would go with what's the smallest this game could be. And then in your back pocket, so to speak, right. then say, hey, if you like this, I have ideas to deluxify it, so to speak. Right. Right. Yeah. That's true. I mean, I absolutely agree and have seen yeah. small, you know, quick this or this pared down version, especially for manufacturing costs, mm -hmm. like cost if that's the bottom line, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think right now the other way to get attention yes. is with table presence. That and if you so have this right. really cool device that doesn't exist anywhere else, mm -hmm. um, whether it's high tech or not, mm -hmm. you know, if you have this cool table presence, yeah. that's a good way. I mean, I know I have utilized that trick before. Right my husband's a graphic designer and does art really well. And we might have a really crappy prototype, but it looks nice. Yeah. And we kind of, it sounds crappy, but we lure a lot of people in by yeah. having something that looks oh, really true. nice. Yeah. Um, and if you have this cool hook, I think mm -hmm. you could lead with that and have it go somewhere. I, I don't know. I mean, how you would build that to begin with, but yeah. you could do it the other way rather than pitching small and showing, Hey, I have this big idea as you could pitch big and true. say, Hey, I also or have a pared down version right. if you don't want to. That's true. Um, okay. I think that, that's probably how I would lead. Right. Yeah. But that's just because I'm a little more like splash oriented. Right. And honestly, I think what it would really matter would be the publisher you're pitching totally. to. Totally. Right. Because Absolutely. some of them will want the pared down version. Mm -hmm. Right. Some of them would want the big table presence. So it right. would probably be if you feel it's worth it, pursue both, mm -hmm. have them ready. But as you're researching publishers, yeah. writing down, okay, these, they mostly publish small games. Mm -hmm. So they're going to want to look at a pared down version. Mm -hmm. They only make big games. This company makes both. Right. So then you can start trying to feel that Taylor, out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I want to, I want to see it so I can yeah. get a hey, better sense of it. We're going to go for dinner later. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> great. Well, I don't think I can, I can't read that far. I can't at all. No.
I think we're okay. No, I think yeah, we're okay. good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, thank you so much. Yeah, you're really welcome. Great. Thank you. And I forgot to mention, we're at Sarah Reed's house right now. This oh, yeah. is her wall, wall of, of games. games. <laughs> so many awesome games. So great. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm so glad I was able to come by Sacramento. Yes. Thank you for making you. the extra stop. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Please. I know you're going out of your way, but we really appreciate yeah, it. No, I'm, I'm glad to meet you. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I know. We've been like hanging out with friends online for a couple years, I think. So it was nice yeah. to actually meet in person. Yeah. That's yes. really cool. <laughs> All right. Well, great. Thanks Thank everyone you. for joining. Bye. Watching. Yes, this was fun. <laughs> and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.